So we are in a series, um, took a little break uh, last week uh, to talk about prayer again. We'll do that, like I say, throughout the time. But we're in a series called Biblical Politics. And we're trying to look at the scriptures and see what, when the scriptures themselves deal with politics, how, how did it get handled with Jesus and the, and the, and the church? And so one of the, the things that we're going to talk about today is um, it, it is, it's, I wanted to say this is really a function of our society, but the truth is, you're going to see it's always been around in politics, really with people, and it's the, what I call the gotcha moment, the gotcha moment, okay? <clears throat> you're all familiar with this. The gotcha moment refers to an instance where someone is caught in a compromising situation or a contradiction, um, often by an opponent um, with the intention of, of embarrassing or discrediting them. The goal is to catch uh, someone out of line with their stated value, okay? So for instance, here's a, here's a political example, and I could have went either way with this, but, but um, let's just say that someone has been really vocal about the importance of the environment and carbon footprint and so forth, and they've promised to make clean initiatives, right? However, uh, during their campaign stops when not, they are uh, confronted by an investigative journalist who asks them, you know, about the dangers of carbon. And then it says, how do you justify flying on a private jet, which happens to be much more polluting than a commercial jet, right? What the journalist is trying to do, they're looking for that gotcha moment, right? You have this value, and yet the way that you live is this, right? <coughs> Um, lately, we had a situation where somebody was, was uh, one of our politicians was part of a lawmaking that in the minimum wage should be this, but when they did research, this person who owns a restaurant chain, they're not paying that minimum wage themselves. And so it's a gotcha moment, right? And again, this can go, there's gotchas on both sides. It's, it's kind of, a, it, it's part of the culture. It's, by the way, it's, a, it's the way of kind of dismissing people and their ideas and, and thoughts. It's, you're trying to get them caught between a rock and a hard place in a difficult situation where no matter which way they go, um, it's a no-win situation where you're caught, in essence, between two opposing values. Now, for followers of Jesus, for Christians, um, there is a similar gotcha tactic, okay? And this usually involves, it could be many, many things, but there's two gigantic big ones that are used, all right? So whenever you say this is true as a Christian, um, one of the gotcha things is, oh, doesn't the Bible say, who are you to judge? Judge not lest ye be judged. In other words, you can't say someone's wrong because that's judgmental and you're not supposed to judge. And it was Jesus who said that. The other one is just this whole idea that just, you know what? Jesus just loved everyone. He didn't, he didn't condemn people, right? Doesn't the Bible say that God didn't send a son to the world to condemn the world, but save the world? In other words, again, you can't say something is wrong because Jesus wasn't about the rules. He was just about love. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to catch you between, oh, well, you say the Bible says this, but the Bible also says you shouldn't judge. And the Bible also said Jesus says love. Therefore, you don't really follow the Bible. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, again, Christians, we do the same thing to others, right? We're looking for God. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, right? That whole adage, when you point a finger, you got three fingers pointing back at you, all right? I'm just pointing out this is the world and society that we live in. All of us live in. And so what I'd like to do uh, today is I'd like to, to take a look at a uh, touchy social issue and how Jesus handled it when this particular thing came up. All right? So how did Jesus handle a touchy show, social issue of his day? All right? So we're going to go to Matthew uh, chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, and start uh, in the uh, couple verses, just tell about where he is and what he had done. And then starting in verse 3, okay? We're going to start with a politically charged question, okay? Which is supposed to set up a gotcha moment. 
It says some Pharisees, that's the religious, Jewish religious leaders of the day. And I think this is really important for this context. This wasn't the world or a politician or someone outside um, the faith. This is somebody supposedly inside the faith and a leader at that, or leaders. So it says some Pharisees came to Jesus, to him, to test him. So we see their motivation. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So this is something that the Pharisees, the religious leaders themselves, debated. It was a, con a, a uh, contentious issue. And right, we've talked about this before, where they come to Jesus and they can't even agree, right? Or they know better not to address that one. Don't bring that one up. That'll get you in trouble, right? And so, but of course, they want to get Jesus in trouble. So they come to Jesus and they kind of lay this at Jesus' feet, looking for a gotcha moment, if you would. Right now, you remember the, the context here, which you wouldn't necessarily remember this, but the context is, is that John the Baptist was just killed because in effect, in effect he spoke out against Herod and uh, his issues both with divorce and then who he remarried. But the other kind of larger context is that there's two huge schools of thought, of Jewish thought at this time. Uh, one uh, followed Rabbi Hillel, the other one followed Rabbi Shammai. Okay? Now, if you followed Rabbi Hillel at, in the first century, you don't necessarily need to know those names. I'll just tell you that if you have a Jewish background, you know those names. They were, they were serious rabbis, kind of like in Christendom, you know, we have our folks you kinda are, that we kind of go to, our go-to kind of folks. These were two go-to rabbis of the time and actually in history. Rabbi Hillel um, said a man could give his wife a certificate of divorce for almost any reason. She burned your food, give her a certificate of divorce, right? You're, you're tired of her, she looked at you wrong, she cut her hair, whatever the case may be. For, for any reason, you give her a certificate of divorce. Where uh, Rabbi Shammai and his followers believed that a man uh, could divorce a wife only if she had been physically unfaithful to him. And then there was this great, there was this great debate between the two sides about what the scriptures say. Now, the Pharisees hoped to trap Jesus by getting him to choose sides in a the theological controversy. And no matter what side he chose, right, there was a gotcha follow-up. There was a gotcha follow-up. Because their goal, we are seeing here, their goal, right, is to trap him. They're not coming to him. Rarely does someone come to you with the, with the judge not answer or the love Jesus answer, and they really want to know the truth. All they want to do is catch you. And kind of, and quite frankly, justify themselves usually. Okay, that's not always the truth, but it's usually true. So let, then let's look at Jesus' response to this charged question. Verse 4, Jesus replies, Haven't you, reply, or haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So Jesus begins his answer here with, haven't you read? All right, so he points them, what he points them to them to is the scriptures. So I think this is really, really important, because sometimes I think people go, well, there's the the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and then there's Jesus. The thing is that Jesus holds the Scriptures, which in that case was only the Old Testament, in high regard. <laughs> that's, his, that's his response. His response wasn't, let me just tell you. There, by the way, there are times that he clarifies or he, or he adds to. This is not one of them. He says, haven't you read what's clearly there? And then he goes to the creation account. How God intended it from the very beginning. And he quotes uh, two verses, two ideas out of the Hebrew scriptures. Right, right in the beginning. First is Genesis 1.27 where it says that God created them male and female. What? To reflect his image. 
In other words, God, and he, God, when God created something, he couldn't just make a man to reflect his image, and he couldn't just make a female to reflect his image. He needed to make a male and female to reflect his image. That's the inherent idea. I can't go into all the details, but that's the inherent idea that there is one God, but there's inherent relationship in that oneness in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are created for relationship. And so, so he goes right back to the beginning and he says, he says, haven't you read the scriptures? Now he also, by the way, uses a, a technique here, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit late, later. He's arguing from a way to your text, because what we're going to find out is there is, a, there is a text that suggests something else. But he's going to the way to your text. He says that, that the way that God intended it is more important than this law that you're quoting. And that's really, really important in a lot of these arguments is context matters. Context matters. And usually when someone comes up with a gotcha, they've taken something out of context just to make their point. They don't really care about what the Bible says. They only care about gotcha. They only care about gotcha. See, Jesus focuses on this ideal that God created male and female to complement, to be in relationship. And that, and that the text in uh, Genesis 2.24 goes on to say, right, that the, that the two shall become one. And for this reason, a man will leave his parents. And that isn't a physical leaving. They usually live with his parents for a long time. Kind of like the Bay Area today. <laughs> but, but the loyalty, the devotion, leave his parents and cling to his wife and then it says that there's, there's this union. The two become one. And Jesus affirms that. Affirms that that was God's original created intent from the beginning. That marriage was designed by God. And it has these three basic aspects that we see in 2.24. One, that, uh, that uh, they leave their parents and promise themselves to each other. That the two are joined together by, making, by taking responsibility for each other's welfare and by loving that person above all others for all time. And the two, it says, will become one flesh in the intimacy of commitment of, of the sexual union that is, that is reserved only for marriage. And then what happens physically, God does spiritually. The two shall become one. And then Jesus... Right says, here, here's here in essence is my is my what I'm saying, right? Um, that um, therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. Period. That's how that was God's intent. Okay. Now, you we can't see it at this point, but the Pharisees are giddy. Okay, the Pharisees are giddy because Jesus seemingly has fallen right into their trap. So they don't argue that's not in the Bible. Right? But they've got them. Because what they're going to do now is they're going to use the Bible against the Bible. Uh, uh, if you would, a gotcha counter argument. Starting in verse 7 here. Why then? Okay, you, I hear what you're saying, Jesus. But why then, they ask, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Drop the mic. Gotcha. Gotcha, Jesus. <laughs> Are you going to tell us that Moses was wrong, Jesus? I mean, Moses is, is the man in Jewish uh, faith. You don't, you don't, I mean, he is, he is studied, he is honored, he is revered, he is gospel, even though we know it was God, not Moses, but still, Moses said, right? Gotcha, Jesus. That's what they're hoping for. They clearly understood that Jesus was denying, um, or that, that what he was saying is he was going to this higher principle. They understood this. Right. But what they want to do, and, and let me just I want to share with you really quickly. I'm not going to have time to develop this, but I think you need to see it. This is this is the passage in the Hebrew scriptures that they're referring to that where God commands divorce. 
All right? Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. Let me just read it really quickly. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, and that, by the way, is the, is the argument, displeasing to him, because he finds something indecent about her. So what's that indecency? And he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from this house. And if after she leaves this house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land, and the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance." So what I want you to see here is, yes, divorce is mentioned here, okay? But this isn't, exactly, this isn't exactly a passage where it's evident that God's coming along and saying, this is fine, I'm, it's pleasing with me. It's, you know, this is, this is kind of that legal loophole. Let's just deal with it. We got to kind of lay it out so everybody kind of understands it kind of under thing. You got to under, this is tough because we live in the modern era. First of all, men and women can divorce. It wasn't, true. it wasn't true in Jewish law. It was only the right given to a man for centuries and centuries and centuries. Right? Only, under Jewish law, only a husband could initiate and carry out a divorce. However, this is really important. The civil laws, like what we see in Deuteronomy, actually protect the woman. I know it doesn't look like it at all. It actually sounds like she's property and it's kind of ridiculous. But uh, at this time... Uh, when a woman was married, what came with her was a dowry. And that became their property or his property. But by giving her the certificate, which is basically dissolving the marriage, the dowry is no longer theirs. It goes back to her. So this actually protects her. This actually protects her. And, if I, and, that, and that first husband who's like, I'm divorcing you, gives up that dowry, and all he's like, well, an idiot I am. He can't go back if the second one doesn't work out and go, eh, you know what, I was wrong. So it was, it was meant actually as a, as a protection. And we, we will find there is a biblical principle that allows for dissolution desol, 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 yeah, of marriage. So let's get, so basically, so they use this. Come on, Moses said, gotcha, Jesus. You said no, but Moses said yes. Are you saying you're greater than Moses? He is, but notice what he says in verse 8. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, Jesus changes the verb. They said, why did Moses command us? It almost suggests like Moses was saying, you got to do this. Right? And what Jesus changes and says, no, 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 no. Uh, he permitted it. And there's a difference. There's an absolute difference between commanding it and wanting it and permitting it. It's the lesser option. And then he tells them why. Why did he permit it? Because God knows the heart of mankind, that we are hard-hearted. That we are hard-hearted. In other words, divorce isn't isn't an option for those who know and love and honor God. It's an option for those who have hardened their heart to God and to the person that they've committed to. That's who divorce is an, is an, is an option for. And notice he says you because he understands they're, they're trying to justify themselves. What we're going to find out is, is that most people, by the way, including the disciples, we're going to find out, Take the liberal view. Ah, it's not that big a deal, right? It doesn't really matter if we're married or not. We can sleep together as long as we love one another and we're just having fun. It's just that time of life. It's not that big a deal, right? It, doesn't, it, it really doesn't matter, you know, who I love or when I love, you know, as long because love is love. And Now, this Jesus who loves everyone, this Jesus who said, judge not unless you be judged, he doesn't take that stance at all. 
He, just, he, he calls a spade a spade. It's because your heart is hard. That's not the way God designed it. It was only allowance made because God knew that you and I were fallen human beings. And hard hearts destroy marriages. A hard heart resists the will of God um, as, the, as the individual looks to themselves and not to their spouse. It, it, a hard heart destroys marriages because we have a hard time extending forgiveness for the past. A hard heart destroys marriages because our hard heart breaks down the trust of the one that we've committed to. Because over and over and over we take advantage of their love. And then their heart gets hard too because of trust. Jesus clearly explains that the divorce dissolves a, a union though. But that this, this idea of divorcing for convenience sake, or not even convenience sake, because it's hard. It's not something, as a matter of fact, he, he's pretty clear. There's, there's only one exception, sexual immorality. Why? Because in, in God's eyes, the act of the physical union is a spiritual, emotional union. It is not just having fun. It is not just it feels good. There, there, is, there is something happening, a union happening that is, that is beautiful, that is divine. And that union is broken when you commit that same act with somebody else who you've not committed to. That is not your spouse. And that, in essence, breaks the bonds of marriage. That's the exception rule. Uh, Paul kind of, I don't think he added to this because of the practical nature of it, but Paul basically said the other aspect is if your spouse just abandons you. You're married to an unbeliever, you become a Christian, and they're like, I don't want to be married to you anymore. Right? And, but it's the same thing. It's basically saying, I'm, I'm breaking the bond kind of a thing. In those two cases, the person who gets divorced can get remarried. But in any other case, in any other case, right, it, when he, you are not allowed to just divorce and then marry someone else. You become, and you cause that person that you marry to become an adulterer, unfaithful in the marriage. Now, those who start from Deuteronomy 24... Their basic presupposition is that divorce is to be expected. The question is, how is it regulated, right? I mean, come on, two people for eternity. We were young. We were naive. You know, I didn't realize that, you know, it wasn't just about how pretty they were or how good they were in bed or, you know, whether or not that they really worked hard or, or that, you know, they liked to hike and I like to read books or whatever. I didn't know that. I was so naive then. I'm so naive, like we're so wise now, right? But Jesus says, uh, uh, what God has joined together, let no one tear apart. See, those who start from Genesis 1 and 2, which is where Jesus starts for them, understand that divorce is evil. It's trying to, to dissolve something that God has, that God, not, not a piece of paper, not a choice that you made, but something that God has joined together. Jesus clearly sees it through this lens. And I actually believe, brothers and sisters, that a lot of the modern arguments, a lot of the, the, the things that we wrestle over, like gender and sexuality and, and divorce, and if you just go back to how God created, how, by the way, when eternity starts, it will be restored to. It clears all this up. It clears it up in terms of what God's intention is and what he desires. Now, just in case you think, you know what, pastor, I mean, I appreciate that you're a pastor, but I think maybe you just kind of drank in a little too much of the, you know, religious stuff here. Because that just seems like a really high bar. It just seems like a really high bar. You're not alone, by the way, in thinking that. 
This is exactly what the disciples thought. The disciples make an observation here, right, in, in verse 10. Notice their response. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. It's better not to marry. Now, now there's a few things, a couple things I want us to see here. Number one, their reaction shows you they believe the liberal view. They, that's, that's the view that they, growing up in Jewish homes, embraced. They embraced the other view, then what Jesus said wouldn't have that response. But they had that response because they're like, man, Jesus, come on, pal. You're drinking the, you know, you're maybe a little too off here, Jesus. Where's the grace? Come on, Jesus. Really, it's probably better not even to marry. And by the way, another text tells us that they, they had this conversation afterwards. This isn't happening right there in front of everybody, but they have this conversation afterwards. But they, they follow up with Jesus, and they clearly understand him. And they say, Jesus, if what you're saying is true, then it's probably better if someone just doesn't get married at all. See, they believe that, he, that Jesus has upheld an impossible standard. And therefore, it seemed better not to make the vow at all than to make the vow and not be able to keep it. It's really tough, Jesus. This is the loving, non-judgmental Jesus we're talking about here. Now notice Jesus' answer in verse 11 and 12. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word. The word that you shouldn't get married, by the way, what they just said. But only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who chose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept this. So here's the, here's the thing. They say, oh, Jesus, that is really tough, so maybe you shouldn't get married at all. And Jesus says, well, just so we're clear, the other option isn't exactly easy either. It's fine, by the way. He, he doesn't, you know, sometimes we kind of put this marriage is the ultimate. You know, like I said, well, we were created to be in relationship. Therefore, to really have everything God wants you want to be married. Jesus obviously does not have this opinion. He holds both up in high regard, both marriage and basically I'm married, married to God. Right? But they're both tough. He said there are, there are three people that, that, that might take the road that you just suggested. The first is someone who is born a eunuch. They don't, have the, they, they don't have the ability, whether it's physically or emotionally or whatever it may be. They don't have the ability. And so they're, they're made eunuchs by God. The second are those who are made eunuchs by uh, a king. I don't want to go into too much detail, but for those of you who are wondering, a eunuch is someone who doesn't have their testicles. Okay. And so what someone would do, if you were, if you, especially if you were a king or you'd have other people around you and your harem and your wife, so you would remove their ability to do anything. They were, and they were a eunuch, right? If you guys remember one of the, in Acts, there's a eunuch on the way back to Ethiopia, I believe it is, and Philip shares the gospel with them. And that's how the, the gospel spread, and it's just on fire ever since in Ethiopia. So some have been made by man, but he says, but there are some who have chosen. They have made a decision. They're like, you know what? Rather than, than be in this union and have my commitment uh, to God and to my spouse, I'm gonna, I want my commitment only to God. And they have chosen that. Jesus, by the way, was one of these. Paul, by the way, was one of these. And Paul would say, Paul actually argues later on, I think we're going to actually get this into Corinthians. This will be a fun one to watch me squirm on. Um, Paul actually says, you know what? I wish you were like me. You weren't married, but it's not a sin. If that's what your thing is, right? But there's this tension here. And notice he says, the one who can accept this should accept this. In other words, again, it's, it's a fine option. But here's the thing. God's standard is high for both. If you stay single, Purity. If you get married within that relationship, purity. There is no plan B. That's the way God intended it to be, period. Now, before I conclude this, I want to do a, take a side note here, okay? Can I take a quick side note? It's really important. 
There are some of you right now that internally, you think everybody can notice, we don't notice, don't worry. You're squirming inside right now because you've gone through a divorce. And the enemy right now is going, oh, he's talking to you. You're so terrible, you're so bad. God can never love you, you're such a sinner. Okay, that's taking this passage out of context. This passage really isn't about the evil of divorce. This passage is about the evil of people who say they love God's word and try to use God's word to not follow God's word. That's what this passage is about. Now, there is a truth there. If you're married, when you said, till death do us part, that's the commitment. And that's, that, that's what God wants. God wants to say, go into this soberly. This is, a, if this is eternally. If after your marriage day, your, your spouse gets hit by a car and it becomes a vegetable, you are committed to them for the rest of their life. To be faithful to them, to support them, even though they can give nothing back to you. They may be cute. You may feel really high. You know, like life is wonderful now, but two years from now, when that's not the case, and also you see the real person they are, the way that they push the toothpaste in the middle, right? Or, or the fact they leave dirty clothes all over the ground or whatever it is. You, there's not a get out of jail free card. You're committed to this. So go into it with eyes wide open. Is this somebody that if they became the worst um, part of themselves, you're still committed to? Not, you make me feel so good. That's, that's the bad, bad way to go. But I'm, com I'm committed to you to thick and thin. By the way, it's also in the relationship. Oh, my goodness. I cannot tell you how many, how many times I've been an idiot. Right? But, I, but there's a security in, 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 that, in that Lynn puts up with me being an idiot. And, ha and for some reason, some way, I wish I, wish I could teach you all this. She could not say it, and I know it. It's, it's a wonderful, secure, wonderful thing. And it actually, actually, in the end, makes me try harder not to be an idiot. I'm not always successful, but I try. There's just there's a massive amount of security in, in this. But this passage is a gotcha moment. Listen, when Jesus interacted with those who had been through this, this turmoil of two souls being ripped apart, it was grace. Remember the woman of the well who had, who had been through five divorces? Five divorces. By the way, we don't even know if it was her fault or not. But we do know she was living with a man she wasn't even married to. And we also know that Jesus didn't say, you're, you're good. You're good. That's okay. No big deal. But on the other hand, he didn't sit there and beat on her, beat on her, beat on her, beat on her. What he did is he, he pointed her to true worship, which is following a God who can do for you and in you what you cannot do for yourself. So the issue, issue isn't whether or not you've been divorced. The issue is, are you willing to say whatever part you're was in it? It may not be your part. It may be that your spouse was the idiot. Usually both people are idiots, but one's a little, maybe a little bit more than the other. Okay. But maybe you were the idiot. Okay. Repent. Just receive what we all know is true. We all know we're all idiots. That's the sin. We're all in that camp. There is nobody here. Maybe divorce was your, was your thing. I have other issues, right? Which, which God looks at it's not so favorably for, for me. Grace, grace, grace. Okay? So just relax. Relax. Okay? The person on your right and left doesn't have it all together. The person on the stage doesn't have it all together. We are all resting in God's grace. But we're all striving to better and better reflect what God asks of us. Okay, so let me just conclude with this. How do we handle, I want to just give you four practical things. How do we handle the touchy political issues and the different opinions on what the Bible says about them? Okay, so here we go. Number one, understand that God's word trumps your feelings. The fundamental question is not how do you feel about this? Or even, by the way, what's a loving response? 
Because we're sinners, we'll get that question wrong. What's the loving response? The question is, what's your biblical conviction? What is, what is it that God lays out in scriptures that I might lean this way, but I can't get over what God says here? And, under, and understand that God's word trumps our feelings. And let me just say that there are different opinions about a lot of political issues that are within, supposedly, the church itself. The universal church is what I'm talking about. People who call themselves Christians. But understand that some of that, if not maybe a lot of that, is from different outlooks on what a Christian is. For some, they're like the Pharisees. To follow God is to follow biblical morals, but they're kind of pliable. Okay? I mean, Jesus was... We, we like that Jesus says, judge not. We like the fact that Jesus says, love one another, right? But we kind of downplay when he says, uh, it's, it's infidelity when you just imagine it in your mind. We don't make so big a deal about that one. He's saying, don't only just be pure physically, be pure mentally. Talk about an impossible standard. That wasn't Paul, that wasn't Pastor Joel, that was Jesus who said that. Matthew chapter 5. And there are, there are others who, who are followers of Jesus who know that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So he lived by grace, understanding that we couldn't fulfill the law, so he did on our behalf. But he also taught us truth that the expectation is, by the power of the Holy Spirit, which comes for those who believe in Jesus, we begin to try to live as holy as we can. That doesn't mean we don't have moments of hardness. It just means that we repent of that, Take another step. And so don't get in this, don't get in debate with somebody, somebody who's just using the word of God. They don't have a biblical conviction. They're just trying to argue with you to change your conviction, which is our second one. Don't fall for the hard-hearted folks who try to use the Bible to judge the Bible. Understand that there's a difference between an honest conversation of, of somebody who comes to you and says, Does the Bible really teach this, whatever the, the issue is. And a lot of folks who just know enough Bible, they saw a TikTok video, they saw a YouTube video, maybe they heard somebody on, you know, one of the news channels say, well, the Bible says judge not lest you be judged. Well, the Bible says da-da-da-da-da, right? And just ask yourself, does this, is this a person who really cares about the Bible? And a lot of times it's not. They're just using it. It is worthless to argue with somebody like that because you're, you're coming from two opposing viewpoints of what reality is. And as long as their viewpoint of the Bible is just this general kind of good guide book, but <laughs> can't take it serious, there's no way to have a serious conversation about taking the Bible serious. Are, are you following me? Okay. Here's a third one. Understands that two things can both be true. Two things can be, a lot of political issues aren't an either or, but a what I call a both and proposition. Okay? A both and proposition. So let me just give you an example of how I believe a, a principle, a biblical principle applies to immigration. All right? And, and this, this is an, a, uh, this is my best guess kind of a thing, okay? So I use Proverbs 6, 30, and 31. This is what Proverbs says. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet, if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. So what we see here is two uh, principles here. On the first principle, it says, listen, there's somebody starving. Maybe their family is starving. And so they turn to, to thievery, right, not as a means to get a good pair of shoes, but a means to feed their family. Don't judge them harshly. Show some grace. Show some mercy. Come on. That's what God shows you. On the flip side, verse 31, it says, listen, but if you're this person and you get caught, don't go, well, I'm justified because I was stuck. No, it's still wrong. And there's a cost. 
you should pay for it. So on one hand, I believe in the immigration issue, we should have absolutely positively grace and mercy and understanding if you're somewhere else in the world and <laughs> you can't feed your family, your family's being persecuted or whatnot. Yes, I, I understand why you would sneak into another country where it's freer, at least for now. I get it. And we should show mercy and grace and a certain level of acceptance. But on the other hand, there should be a consequence for breaking the law. So it's not an either or, it's a both and. It's just that one side likes this principle, but they're neglecting the other principle. And this side likes another principle, but they're neglecting that principle. For us, it's not so easy. It's both. Are you following me? You have to agree with me, but are you following me? This means yes, this means no. You're following me. Okay, I just want to make sure you understand the principle. Lastly, as the worship team comes up, remember when it comes to the world, those outside the church who are not followers of Jesus, our goal is to advance the gospel rather than to win an argument, which is basically see the first three weeks of this series so far. Always keep that in mind. So when you have folks that say, that, that kind of, that are outside of the church that go, well, didn't Jesus say, right? Now, you're welcome to say, well, actually, in context, that, that passage doesn't apply to this principle, right? And if they're interested in that, you can explain it. But if they're not interested in that, just leave it alone and, ref and say, well, you know what? We agree to disagree. You just need to know, even if we disagree, God still loves you, and so do I. How can I serve you? How can I be your friend? How can I support you? Because that's the greater point, not winning an argument. Inside the church, I think we, we contend for the faith and we try to get each other to kind of see the faith. And that's why I think Jesus, you know, uh, took this one on a little bit. It's because it was the religious leaders. And he knew that they were, taking, they were taking a principle and they were doing two things with the same principle. On one hand, they were justifying themselves and then on the other hand, they were using it to beat down people that they thought less of. So they had good reasons for divorce, and so God was okay with them. But other people who weren't pure in their marriages, right, or, or were prostitutes or whatever, be, well, we're going to beat down on them. Jesus saw right to the heart of that, and he calls them out. It's because of the hardness of your heart. If you really want to honor God, then live to his level. And by the way, Jesus knew that we could not live to his level and that we would need him to go to the cross and pay the price for us that we could not pay ourselves. And thank God he did, amen? All right, let me pray for us. All right, Lord. I hope I didn't mess this up too much. I pray, dear God, that where your truth is, it reflects your heart that it may stick in people's hearts and it may find good soil therefore that we may give forth to our own choice to follow you despite what the world tells us, to our own conviction, dear God, um, to be pure and to be set aside and to be different than the world, dear God. At the same time, Lord, I pray they help us rightly balance what it means to contend for the faith and what it means just to stay away from endless arguments and debate that go nowhere. Give us the wisdom there to God to know how to, the difference between explaining truth and your love to people and just arguing with them to try to get to be right, dear Lord. We need your grace, first of all, because we're all sinners. We need your mercy, dear God, because we, we really don't want to live the way that you called us to, dear Lord. We need your strength to live that way. We need your discernment, dear Lord, in interacting with others. And we, Lord, quite frankly, we need your heart of love and compassion for others because I don't think, dear God, I care about people as much as you do. So would you do that work in us and through us by the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.